And then we're going to have a brief look at, at this rather intriguing fishing story in the Gospel of John and chapter 21. And let's think about a context to start with. For, for 40 rather remarkable days, extraordinary days, our Lord spent time with his disciples after his resurrection and before his ascension. And, and the wonderful things that they experienced together built and created that strong conviction and understanding, which then sent them forth to preach the gospel and extend the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. The absolute certainty of a risen Lord, proven with many infallible proofs. And it was the events of those 40 days and some of those many infallible proofs which are recorded for us in one or two places in Scripture. Of course, they saw it, they witnessed it, and they recorded it for our sakes so that we can come and read it now. I'd like you to come back with me to John chapter 20 and just have a look at how John chapter 20 concludes. And it's, it's rather intriguing to see the structure here of the, of the epistle of John. So John chapter 20, verse 30, many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So we're told that the reason these things are recorded is that we might believe, that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, that we believe that he is the Son of God, and that through that belief, we may have life through his name. Now, in some ways, it almost seems like that's a fitting conclusion at the end of the gospel. Having described all of these events, we have this little summation at the end of chapter 20, which describes why these things had all been recorded for us. But then suddenly, somewhat unexpectedly, we have this little addendum, which is John chapter 21. And so this evening, our attention wants to be, is to be focused on, on this little addendum that's added on here at the end of, of the Gospel of John. The most important of the Lord's interactions with the disciples in that period of 40 days took place up north in the region of Galilee. And in those events, in, in those events our Lord was strengthening their character and their faith for the work that lay ahead. These were the lessons that they were to learn as they were to become apostles or one sent by our Lord Jesus Christ, both for gospel proclamation and also for their work as ecclesial shepherds. Now, the fact that this little event is going to take place in the area of Galilee has been made very clear to the disciples already before this event. Some days earlier, actually, in Back in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 32, our Lord had specifically told his disciples that after his resurrection, he would go before them into Galilee. Interesting words. He would go before them into Galilee. Later, when our Lord met the women immediately after his resurrection, he asked the women to go and remind the disciples to pass this message on to his disciples. So Matthew 28, verse 10, then said Jesus unto them, be not afraid, go and tell my brethren that they go into Galilee and there shall they see me. Now, as if that wasn't enough, we then find that the angels said the same thing to them. Mark 16, verse 7, but go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him as he said unto you. So the attention of the disciples has been, has been very carefully focused on the fact that our Lord was going to meet with them in the region of Galilee after his resurrection. And there are multiple occasions there in the record where that message is conveyed to them through the women, by the angel, and by the Lord himself. So Christ's very deliberately going to take them back now to where their journey has begun, to where they had first learnt of the gospel. 
and where their foundations had been laid. It's interesting to reflect on the fact that all of the surviving disciples or apostles had actually come originally from the area of Galilee. So in John chapter 21, we have them being brought back full cycle or full circle back to their origins again. Now, we won't go and spend time uh, looking at this now, but towards the beginning of the Gospel of John, back in chapter 2 and verse 11, with the, the beginning of miracles, it's done in Cana of Galilee. Also at the beginning, we first meet Nathaniel from, sorry, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee. Uh, by the time we get to John chapter 4, we have our Lord back in the area of Cana of Galilee, where it says he, he did the second of the miracles. And we're also told in, in the early books of John, early chapters of John, that he manifested his glory to them in that region. So now what we have at the other end of the book, as it were, was them being taken full circle back to the beginning, where again his glory is going to be manifested to them. Why Galilee? Why Galilee? Why, why take them back to the area of Galilee? Well, Galilee is rather an interesting place. From the beginning, uh, from earlier times in Israel's history, it was never seen as being a, I guess you could say, a salubrious place. It was never held in very great esteem. Do you remember the, the incident back in um, First of Kings chapter 9, where Solomon gave a gift of 20 cities in that area to Hiram? And uh, Hiram was rather displeased. He looked at these cities and said, well, what's this that you've given me? And, and the area of Galilee stayed with that sort of a reputation. By the time our Lord was manifested in his first visit, his first coming, the Jewish leaders very clearly despised the region of Galilee. So in John 7, verse 41, others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? And then a few verses later, in verse 52 of John 7, they answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee cometh no prophet. And yet it was in the region of Galilee that our Lord first revealed himself, where the first miracles were done. I'd like you to come with me, perhaps leave a marker here in John chapter 20, but come back with me to Isaiah chapter 9, because we're given a couple of, of insights and quite helpful clues here back in Isaiah chapter 9 as to what it was about the area of Galilee which made it particularly appropriate for our Lord's work of salvation and the call of the gospel to be manifested in that region of Galilee. So picking up the record, Isaiah 9 verse 1, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light, and they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. When it talks there in verse 1 about it being Galilee of the nations, the word nations there is the Hebrew word goy, G-O-Y. Often it is used as a reference to, na to nations or a heathen roundabout, but, but it's also used of Israel as well. So, for example, in the promises to Abraham, talking about the people, the ordinary people. So it's a phrase that's used of a, of a group of people. They can be Jew or they also can be Gentile. By the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, we know that the, the populace of the region of Galilee was, was rather mixed. Uh, we think of the area nearby of Decapolis, uh, which was a mixture, a, a, a league actually of 10 different little city states. Um, we think of the, uh, of the mixture of Jew and Gentile that was living in that region by the time of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a description of, of the people, the ordinary common people. But these people, of course, are walking in darkness. So the people themselves are in darkness. And the location they find themselves in is described as, and just listen to these words, very graphic, the land of the shadow of death. 
It's a very graphic description, isn't it, brothers and sisters, of the human race. All of the people walking in darkness in the land of the shadow of death. It's the plight of the human race. That's the very point. This is where our Lord began his work of salvation. When the good news or the gospel was extended to people who would hear, it's the place where preaching began, where the first miracles were performed. It's about our Lord's work amongst the ordinary people who would respond rather than the sophisticated and the wealthy. And here, the multitudes responded to a message of hope, a message of love. Now, the work of the disciples is going to be to continue the preaching of the gospel after their Lord had departed. This work, which the Lord had begun in the region of Galilee, was now to be their responsibility. And so our Lord took them back to where that work had begun, back to where the foundation was laid as the very best environment to do this final work of preparation. In a sense, you could say that this time period up in the region of Galilee was to be a finishing school, in a sense. It's a time of the final polishing of the disciples, the preparation for them to continue that work once he was gone. It was a process of their perfecting for that work. And so he took them away from the region of Jerusalem, back to the area of Galilee. He drew their attention back to the basics of the gospel, and he rounded out the critical lessons that he needed them to take in and to learn. You know the intriguing thing? Despite numerous references to the fact that the Lord was to meet them in Galilee for some special event, this little chapter in John chapter 21 is the only record we have of his interactions with the disciples up in the region of Galilee. Now, we know that there were other meetings there. So, for example, Matthew 28 and verse 16, it says that he met with the 11 in a mountain near Galilee. I suspect, although we don't know for sure, that that, that extraordinary Bible school or Bible conference that's referred to in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 6, where our Lord met with 500 brothers and sisters together, was probably in the same region. But John 21 remains the only passage that tells us in any detail of the interchange that took place in the region of Galilee between our Lord and his disciples. So what's so important about John chapter 21? Well, it is, it is framed in a rather extraordinary setting. I mean, it's a fishing story and a chat around a campfire. Of all things, here at the penultimate stage of our Lord's interaction with his disciples, his work with them, just, just before he departs, we have a fishing story. And yet on the backdrop of this rather interesting little event is constructed a very powerful set of lessons for the disciples and instructions for them. So we have a, a seemingly innocuous little event but it teaches some very powerful lessons. Actually, it harks back to some, some previous events that have taken place, but it's pregnant with meaning for them and embodied in it. And, and as we start to read through the chapter, and of course, we don't have time to look at the whole chapter in detail this morning, we find that it, it gives us searing and, and, and great searing insights into the, into the needs and the mind of the disciples. And if ever we needed reminding that our, our Lord can see into our hearts and minds, and and he knows what things we need to perfect our characters in all the events and trials of life. If we ever need reassurance of that, then this chapter does that. It's, it's so sharp in places that it hurts. All right, so let's turn our attention now to John chapter 21. And, and we're only going to be looking at the first little section, which is, the, is this little fishing story. And we meet the characters here on the beach at the Sea of Tiberias. Now, they'd been told to go there because their Lord would go before them. Mark chapter 16, verse 7. So here's our first clue to what this story is conveying to us. This record is, is conveying something. There's a lot of symbology sitting in this record, which, which teaches them lessons in the same way that our Lord used, used stories from ordinary life in his parables. 
he's going to be conveying some lessons to them. And we know to begin with that our Lord had gone before them to that spot. But despite him having gone before him, they're still going to have to wait for him. So just keep those two things in mind. Our Lord has gone before. And yet here are the apostles and the disciples who have to wait for him. Now, Simon Peter, impetuous, energetic, forthright, bold Simon Peter, was not great at waiting. Wasn't one of his greatest qualities. Ah, I'm going to go fishing, he says. And nothing loath, the others all happily agree. Oh, we'll go with you too, they say. Just read verse 3 and, and sort of imbibe a sense of, of this happening. You can see these disciples sitting there waiting for their Lord. And suddenly Simon Peter starts up in verse 3. Simon Peter says to them, I'm going to go fishing. They say unto him, I oh, will also go with you. So they went forth and entered into a ship immediately. These are active men, strong fishermen. To think is to act. And it was at the moment the idea is, is suggested, they're straight off into the boat and out onto the waters of the Galilee. It's second nature to them. They're fishermen by trade. They're possibly hungry, because we're told in verse 5 that they had no food. So they launch their little boat out onto the lake, and they take out their fishing nets. Now, of course, the region of Galilee is very dominated by the lake. The word Galilee actually means, literally means a circuit. So we've got a great big round lake and dotted around the circumference of the lake as a succession of villages and little cities. The Lake of Galilee, of course, features very prominently in the gospel records. Our Lord crossed backwards and forwards across the lake on many occasions. The multitudes either ran around the lake or took ship across the lake to follow him. There were storms on the lake, sometimes with the Lord in the boat, sometimes without the Lord in the boat. But the most wonderful feature of the Lake of Galilee, as far as the disciples were concerned, is that it was full of fish. And of course, they were fishermen. And that becomes our next clue. Because the role as fishermen becomes very significant, not just here, but in the gospel record as a whole. In fact, think about this. Of course, they were engaged in the very act of fishing, a number of them, at the time when they were given their call to become disciples. Matthew chapter 4, verse 19 and 20. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. So the Lord himself gives them this nexus between their actual role as fishermen and the task that he's called them to become, to become fishers of men. And they abandon their nets and they follow him. And our Lord was then able to draw on the, the analogy of fishing on multiple occasions throughout the gospel record. And in fact, we find in scripture, and not just in the gospel records, but right through scripture, the, the, the spiritual analogy which is, is drawn from this, this theme of fishing is very clear. I'd like you to come back, back with me to Matthew chapter 13. This is one of the parables that our Lord told, this time about the kingdom of heaven, and he equates it to a fishing net and a fishing exercise. Matthew chapter 13 and commencing at verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to the shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world, the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, shall cast them into the furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So he uses the parable of fishing to teach them a lesson about the kingdom of heaven. So the gospel call is being likened here to a net, and it's cast into the waters, and it gathers of all of these fish. Now note an interesting feature here. Here it gathers a vast array of fish of all sorts, both good and bad. 
And there's also a sorting process. So when this net is drawn to the shore, there is a sorting out of the good from the bad. Just note these because there's a little contrast that's painted between this parable and the events that we're reading of in John chapter 21. And we'll note this quite soon. Okay, so here in John chapter 21, when Peter says, let's go fishing, and they all hop in the boat and go off fishing with them, we have the disciples reverting to their past way of life. They pick up the net and the oars, they hop into the boat, and they venture out into the deep. Straight away, brothers and sisters, the record's telling us that the scene is set for our Lord to teach them some fundamental lessons based on the analogy of fishing, which were particularly germane to this time, the last 40 days, his final preparation of the disciples before they venture forth to extend the gospel net. And you can read the, there's like a, a latent potency in the record here as you see them setting the scene for what now transpires. So these great experts, experienced fishermen, they set out on the lake and they start to fish. And they fish all night and they catch absolutely nothing. You can imagine them letting the nets down into the water, bringing them in again, nothing. So they try again, they cast the net out, they circle it round, they draw it back into the boat, absolutely nothing. So they try it again, all night they let this net down and they find absolutely nothing. I guess you could say it's a bit of a letdown for them. All night, they toil and toil. Now, these are energetic and very determined men. They knew how to fish. They would have worked that lake, that lake backwards and forwards that, that night, trying in vain to catch even one little spray. But there was just nothing there. Oops. That doesn't bode too well, does it? For men who have been called to become spiritual fishermen. All their labor, all their effort, all their skill to no avail, not even a goldfish. So what's gone wrong? Well, let's complete the story first, and then we will see if we can work out what's going wrong here. So as day breaks, these weary and probably rather dispirited and disappointed men are returning to the shore. In verse 4 of John chapter 21, when it says that it was in the morning, it literally means the daybreak. So we've got that, that sort of half-light period, just as the darkness is starting to give way to the gloom of the half-light of the dawning of the new day. They're very close to shore by this stage. Uh, verse 8 tells us that they're about 200 cubits out. That's about 100 metres from shore. And they discern a man standing on the beach. But in that half-gloom of the dawn, they don't recognise who he is. So he calls out to them and his voice comes out across the water. Children, do you have any food? Which is what the meat means. The word food here implies fish that they've caught ready to be eaten. They answer him rather abruptly, no. There's no niceties here, are there? These are rather disappointed, tired men and hungry. No. So then the voice carries out across the water again. Put the net down on the right side of the boat. Now, I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but as I read that, it seems like a rather provocative thing to suggest to expert fishermen who have just spent the entire night fishing, but with no success, and who are now hungry and tired. What do you mean put out the net on the right side of the boat? From a human point of view, it makes no sense, almost insulting. But one of the things that strikes me about this record, rather surprisingly, is the disciples didn't react badly. They actually took note and they followed this man's instruction and they let the, note, the, the neck down on the right-hand side of the boat. Now, when you think about it, that is rather surprising. I suspect there may be a couple of reasons for that. The first is that he actually speaks with some authority. He doesn't just say, put the net down on the right side of the boat. You see what it says there in verse 6? Put the net down on the right side of the boat and you shall find. Now, that's an emphatic and very confident statement. It must have struck them that way. 
But I also wonder if they remember another day, an earlier day, when a rather remarkable event took place. Once again, they had been unsuccessful after toiling all night and fishing. Can you think of that other incident? Well, let's go back and have a look at Luke chapter 5. And we're going to find that there are some remarkable similarities between Luke chapter 5 and John chapter 21. Luke chapter 5. We'll pick up the record in verse 1. All the people are pressing as he's standing there by the lake of Galilee. He sees two boats and he enters into one of the boats and he uses it as a preaching platform. The fishermen had gone out of them and were mending their nets, it says on verse 2. Verse 3, he sits in Simon Peter's boat and he gets him to push out a little from the shore and he uses it as a preaching platform. Then when he's finished speaking, he says to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. Now, Simon Peter says to him in verse 5, Master, we've toiled all the night. We've taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Now, as you read those words, can you sense the expression that's sitting in those words? He's patient, but slightly exasperated and is humouring of the whims of his master. You can imagine him thinking, well, perhaps... Perhaps he should stick with what he's good at, which is preaching. And, and I know all about fishing. And we've worked all night and the fish aren't there at the moment. Nevertheless, at thy word, we will let down the net. Bang! Suddenly, immediately, the net is, is completely full of, so much so, full of fish, that the net starts to break. So they summons over the other boat. And it comes in and that boat's full. And, and then the second boat is full. And all of a sudden, the boat starts to sink. It's not just a, oh, here's a slight success. It explodes with success. The first net breaks. They call the second boat. The first boat's loaded. The second boat's loaded. So many fish, the boats start to sink. There are superlatives breathing through that record. Now, a few things are accomplished. First of all, in verse 8, Peter's humbled. He acknowledges his errors as a sinful man. Depart from me, O Lord, I'm a sinful man as he throws himself down on his knees in front of the Lord. They learn to trust their Lord's judgment, and they learn to appreciate how much superior he was to themselves. But secondly, our Lord was able to use this little event to make it abundantly clear the lesson that he's teaching about fishing. Now we know that because then he repeats the message of their call. In verse 10, fear not. From now on, I will teach you to catch men. And they forsook all and followed him. So our Lord's very clearly using these fishing experiences to teach them lessons about their calling and to prepare them for that future work. In fact, there's at least five occasions during his ministry where our Lord draws on the, the theme of fishing to teach them spiritual lessons. Perhaps here in John chapter 21, they recalled that rather unexpected result back in Luke chapter 5, because they oblige by letting their nets down again, but this time on the right side of the boat. Now, immediately the nets are full. In fact, so full, they can't draw the net into the boat because of the multitude of fishes. We're told that in John 21 and verse 6. So at this point, John, ever perceptive and discerning, suddenly realizes who it is. Ah, he said, Peter. It's the Lord. And Peter, thrilled, excited, impetuous, he hurriedly snatches up his fishing garments because he's naked. He girds them around him and he throws himself overboard to thrash through the water in an impatient desire to get to his Lord as fast as he can by the most direct route. All thought of the boat, all thought of the fish, all thought of his fellow fishermen, goes completely out of his mind as he's got one thought, I want to get to the Lord as fast as I possibly can. Now, a bit more sedately, the others follow, dragging the heavy net to shore with them. We're pointedly told they went far out, about 200 cubits. Now, when they reach the shore, they find that the Lord already has a fire going. And on the fire are some fish already cooking, plus some bread, which they share with them. All right, brothers and sisters, if our Lord used other fishing stories to teach them lessons, what are the lessons for them here 
in this fishing story from John chapter 21. Well, what does this rather simple event convey? Bear in mind, of course, this is this carefully stipulated event which was going to take place in Galilee. The one that the Lord told them about before his crucifixion. The one that he got the women to remind them about that the angels also reminded them about. And remember the angel's very deliberate words in Mark 16, verse 7. Go your way and tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said unto you. So this lesson is going to be of particular import to the one who's most prominent in many of their activities, to Peter. All right, so what lessons does Peter have to learn here? And more particularly, brothers and sisters, for us this evening, what does it teach us about our work as we prepare faithfully to meet our Lord? Well, some parts of this record are quite clear, aren't they? We've already seen that fishing is used by the Lord as a symbol of the gospel call. It goes out to other people to call them into the gospel of hope. We look at the theme of the lake and we know that lakes and seas or any large body of water in scripture is used as a symbol of the nations and of the peoples. And the fact that it's called Galilee or the region is called Galilee of the peoples makes that element rather obvious. But what about the theme of the boat? And we find that in the scripture, the theme of the boat is used often as a symbol of the ecclesia, the household of faith. In fact, that's been the case right back since the days of Noah, who moved with faith, prepared a, a, an ark to the saving of his house. So here we have an ecclesial boat manned by faithful disciples, which tries to extend the gospel net, the invitation to come to the kingdom hope. Now, early we, earlier we noted some, some helpful parallels between the record in Luke chapter 5 and this record here in, in John chapter 21. Now, the linkages are helpful, but at this point in the narrative, we start to notice that there are some very quite pronounced, in fact, even, even highlighted differences between what took place in Luke chapter 5 and here in John 21. In Luke chapter 5, the Lord was in the boat. Here he is not. In Luke chapter 5, the nets break. Some fish could escape. The nets damaged. Not so here. In Luke chapter 5, the ships come near to sinking. There's no such issue here. They draw the net to shore. <clears throat> or if we think about the parable, in the parable, the point that's emphasized is that there's all sorts of fish gathered, both good and bad, and then they're sorted. Here in this record, there's no reference to bad fish being cast out. In fact, here, they're all described as being great fish in verse 11. And in fact, they're also all individually numbered. <clears throat> so what's happening here? Well, yet again, the story is teaching lessons about the gospel call, brothers and sisters. But this time, it's actually got a different message. This time, it's focusing on the conduct and the behavior of the fishermen and what's needed, the elements that are needed to bring the good fish to shore. So this is not just a story about fishing. It's about the conclusion of the fishing journey. And it highlights what brings success. Do you know, brothers and sisters, our fishing journey is almost over. The Lord's standing there, just over there, as it were, on the shore. Can you see him? Can you see our Lord in the half light of the dawning new morn, the dawning day? In fact, our Lord is calling us in. Little children, do you have the food you need? Have you had any success? You've been slaving away. You've been toiling all night in the dark by yourselves. Have you conquered? Have you succeeded? Have you managed to overcome in your own strength? Has your journey been entirely successful? Well, just look at us, brothers and sisters. Look at us as individuals in our families and homes and in our ecclesias, examine our own lives and ask that question. Have we been immensely successful? And the answer in one word 
is often no. So what's gone wrong? Well, here's a group of men who were supposed to wait for their Lord, but because they're impatient and they're tired of waiting, they enthusiastically set off going fishing. They're pretty confident. They know what they're doing. After all, it is their calling. But they don't have their Lord in the boat and they don't have his instruction or his guidance. So they set off at their own instigation to achieve their own objective in this matter, in their own strength, with their own gear, and their journey is an abject failure. Absolute failure. They catch nothing, zip, absolutely not one fish. So they're faced with their inability to land a single fish in their boat that night. And yet they're the experts. Can you see what they're being taught? Can you see how their minds are being prepared to listen to a lesson from the Lord? And brothers and sisters, if we set off in our strength, knowing that we're pretty clever at this, to fill the ecclesial boat with fish, well, we won't succeed either. So what's this, this little incident telling us, brothers and sisters, about how we conduct ourselves in ecclesial life and when it comes to extending the gospel call? What does it tell us about our plans, our hopes, our aspirations, and how we go about doing things? You know the rather sad thing in the narrative here? As they head back to the shore, as they approach it, in the dawning of a new day, they saw a man on the shore, but they didn't recognize who he was. Verse 4 tells us the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. And even when he spoke, they didn't recognize his voice. Now think about that as a theme in scripture, brothers and sisters. John 10 verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and am known of mine. Or again in verse 27 of that chapter, my sheep hear my voice. Brothers and sisters, our Lord has gone before us. We've been out all night rowing the ecclesial boat on the Sea of Nations, we're now heading in on the final approach, in towards the shore, the end of the journey, where our Lord has already gone, where he stands waiting for us, he's calling for us. Can we see him, brothers and sisters? Can we see our Lord standing there on the shore, our journey almost finished, calling us, calling us? Can we see him in the advancing light? of the dawning day? Do we hear his voice? Do we recognize his call? And brothers and sisters, the journey's almost over. There's only a hundred meters, of, as it were, to the shore. We can almost see him there standing on the seashore. Or have we become so weary, so tired and dispirited after an endless and pointless night full of toil that we've lost sight of what's happening around us and lost our ability to see our Lord who was gone before? Do we recognize him, brothers and sisters? Do we hear his voice? Or is the Lord a distant stranger on a distant shore? Because if we're to succeed, brothers and sisters, in this journey, then we need to be able to see our Lord with the eye of faith and we need to be able to hear his voice. This is the spirit of the bride, isn't it? Think of the, the bride in Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 8. The voice of my beloved, she says. Behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. She hears her beloved coming, and she's thrilled in response. And our Lord is there, brothers and sisters. As we see the things that are happening around us in the world today, has there ever been a generation that's been able to hear his voice and see his progress? skipping upon the hills, leaping upon the mountains, as we see what's happening in the world around us, can we see our Lord coming and hear his voice? And now the Lord gives them some instructions that make the journey a success. Just before we go there, let's overlay a few other features here to this particular record. First of all, when Peter recognizes who it is, he wants to go straight to him. He couldn't go straight away. He had to do something first. What was it? 
Well, unfortunately, he's in the boat and he doesn't have his garments on. Now, he has purpose designed fishing garments. In fact, the word fisher's coat, that little phrase fisher's coat in John 21 means a special cloak for fishing. So Peter's actually been equipped with a garment specially designed for fishing. And yet in the sweat of laboring and the toil of the night, he had taken those garments off and now he's naked. Oops, can't meet the Lord like that. So hurriedly he has to scrabble around in the bottom of the boat, find his garment and, and gird his garments back on again. Can you see the spiritual lesson, brothers and sisters, that that conveys to us? Revelation 16, verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. It means unexpectedly. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. We too, brothers and sisters, have been given special garments. It's the covering provided through coming into the saving name of Christ. They are purpose designed for us. So where are they? Where are our spiritual garments? What sort of state are they in? Have they come off? Have we misplaced them? Do we want to find ourselves desperately scrabbling round in the bottom of the boat in the half light of dawn, trying to find our garments to tie them on ourselves again in a hurry when we're called upon to meet our Lord? Eager to meet him, but unable to do so until we find where we had laid our garments. There are so many very practical lessons that come out of this, this little incident for us, brothers and sisters, about the need for us to preserve the garments that we've been given to make sure that we're ready to meet the Lord when he calls us. And we can sense what Peter is being taught here. Peter, are you in a good state for this work? Are you ready for our Lord? And then when, our, when the master calls them, he said, children, do you have any food? And that's a fascinating little phrase. We don't get the full impact of the words in the English when we read just children. The word children used here is not the normal word used for children, for ordinary children. It's the word paideon. And it literally means newborn babies. It's particularly used of newborn babies who are helpless and immature. You know what Vines says, Vines Expository Dictionary says of this word? It's used metaphorically of believers who are deficient in spiritual understanding. Ouch. What a word for our Lord to use. I wonder how our Lord would address us, brothers and sisters. Now, when they acknowledge their failure to be able to bring in a load of fish into the boat or to the shore, the instruction comes out to cast the net on the right side. Now that's such a simple little phrase, isn't it? Simple instructions. And yet it makes the difference between this journey being a success or a failure, following the instructions of our Lord. And what it tells us, and it's very reassuring, brothers and sisters, and I find this very encouraging, is that despite laboring all night, despite at times seeming to have labored with wasted effort, still a triumphant outcome is possible on the journey. Even at the last moment, there is triumph here in the last possible minute. They're only meters from the shore because at last they turn to following the instructions of the Lord and that turns this journey into a success. So they're told to let this net down on the right hand side and the, list, the word literally means on the right hand. Now, of course, from a natural man's point of view, this is folly. If there's fish in the sea and you cast the net in, what does it matter what side of the boat you throw the net over? So let's ask ourselves what the theme of the right hand conveys in Scripture. <clears throat> First of all, we know that the right hand is the place where Christ dwells. We also know from Scripture, actually, that the right hand is a place of strength for us from God. Psalm 16, verse 8, I have set Yahweh always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. So it's a place of strengthening from God. Or listen to these words, Ecclesiastes 10, verse 2, a wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. 
So there's a way of wisdom here. That's Ecclesiastes 10 verse 2. There's a way of wisdom here. The wise man's heart is associated with the theme of the right hand, whereas a fool's heart is associated with the left. But the record's saying more than that. Because you see, this fishing story is about the successful conclusion to the journey, about bringing these fish to shore. And these fish are all accepted fish. They're great fish, each one individually numbered by God. So the fish in this particular net are a representation of the accepted. Do you know, brothers and sisters, the accepted are always found on the right hand. Matthew 25, verse 33, he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. So there's a theme here, brothers and sisters, of the successful bringing in of the faithful into the gospel of the kingdom. <clears throat> sometimes, brothers and sisters, sometimes our labors seem to be of no avail, an endless cycle of toil and fruitless endeavor. Sometimes, perhaps, we come to the conclusion that we have wasted previous years or times and opportunities on things that don't profit. <clears throat> Sometimes we just seem to be making no progress at all. So perhaps we also need to ask ourselves the question, <clears throat> am I casting out the net on the right side? Am I actually following our Lord's instructions, truly following our Lord's instructions? in our labours and in our endeavours. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because now, with the Lord's involvement, following his instructions, the net is suddenly full. Do you see what the record says in verse 11? It's so pointed, yet the net does not break. It's painting a very deliberate contrast, isn't it, with the previous sentence in Luke chapter 5, because... This is talking about the successful bringing in of the faithful saved by the Father. <clears throat> and now, in verse 6, the net is so full that they're not able to bring it into the boat. And the word means they're not strong enough, strong enough in body or power to be able to draw this net in. Can you see, brothers and sisters, how layer upon layer upon layer upon layer, the same message is being driven home to the disciples by this little incident. You can't do it by yourself, can you? You can't draw the net in, can you? You're not strong enough, are you? You don't have enough strength in mind, in body or power to do it. First, you need to do it the right way. But even then, you're not strong enough to land that net by yourself. Well, listen to these words. This word draw, they could not draw it in. And think about what the net represents of drawing in the disciples. John 6, verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. It's the same word. This is the Father's work. And I will raise him up at the last day, said the Lord. This is Christ's work, drawn by the Father, raised up by the Son. It's God's work, brothers and sisters, that we're involved in an ecclesial life. And when we share the hope of the gospel by, with others, it's God's work. We're simply laborers together with God, in the words of Paul. And it's at that point that John realizes who it is. He's manifest by his power to help them catch the fish. And that's why he says to Peter, it is the Lord. So here's Peter, desperate to be with the Lord, impetuous but wonderfully loving and loyal, throws himself overboard to get to Christ in a hurry. But there's some more lessons for him. Loving? Certainly. Affectionate? Absolutely. Thoughtful of the needs of his brothers and sisters? What about his fellow labourers? What about the ecclesial boat? What about bringing the fish to shore? It's such a contrast, isn't it, with the words of the Apostle Paul, Philippians 1, verse 23, I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know I shall abide and continue with you all 
for your furtherance and joy of faith. It's a very strong contrast with Peter, who abandons his fellow laborers and the boat and the fish to get to the Lord himself. And we can sense the lessons that Peter still has to learn. In fact, these are the lessons which in the rest of the chapter, the Lord gently but irresistibly teaches him. Peter, do you love me? If so, feed my sheep and lambs. These are lessons for Peter about ecclesial shepherding. They're, they're lessons for all the disciples and brothers and sisters. They're very powerful lessons for us as we occupy till our Lord comes. Lessons about caring for our fellow sheep. Lessons about whose work it is to bring the net to shore. And later, when the Lord says, go and bring of the fish that you've caught, at that point, Peter goes back and helps to bring the net ashore. So for us, brothers and sisters, we stand here today and we walk up with the disciples, as it were, to the Lord, to where he's standing. And what do we see? Well, we see a fire lit, coals of fire. And on the coals, why, some fish. He's already done it. He's, he's already got fish. He's actually already achieved what they were not able to achieve. He's ahead of us. He's already brought in these fish from somewhere and invites us to sit down and to share with him in that meal of fish and bread, a little fellowship meal there on the shore with the Lord, with the food that he has provided. But then he says to them in verse 10, bring of the fish that you have caught. Yes, I've already obtained the fish, he said, but I want you to go and bring and contribute of your labours also. And there's a joining together of what our Lord had already achieved, which they couldn't achieve in their own strength, together with the labours they have achieved based on his help and his guidance. And they sit down together in joint fellowship together. It's interesting, this, this little contrast between catching fish and then sharing the eating of the fish with the Lord. It reminds us of the principles that come up in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 13. Those who serve the altar are partakers with the altar. There's a lot of other elements here, brothers and sisters, which we haven't had an opportunity to have a look at yet. The meaning of the 153, the discussions with Peter and John, how their interaction in the boat then lays the scene for what happens later in the chapters with the discussion of them, what Christ says about their respective deaths at the end of the chapter. But for us, let's conclude now, this evening, by thinking about those simple little words when he says in verse 12, come and dine. It's something which we do, brothers and sisters, every Sunday morning. We come and dine, we sit down in fellowship with our Lord to acknowledge that without Yahweh building the house, they labour in vain that build it. To reflect upon the fact that this fishing journey needs the guidance of our Lord if it's to be successful. It needs to be carried out in accordance with his instruction that we are but little infants, not clever enough, not strong enough, to even be able to draw the net in when the Father blesses that work. But we have this assurance. No matter what happens in ecclesial life, brothers and sisters, the boat does not sink. And this net will not break. And assuredly, this net is full of great fish. And those fish will be brought to shore. So now, brothers and sisters, we pause. And we think about the one who made it all possible. Brothers and sisters, he's standing on the shore. He's not far away from us. He's calling to us in the light of the approaching dawn. He's telling us what we need to do to have this journey end in success. And if we follow his instructions, brothers and sisters, even at this late stage of our journey, triumph is able to replace our failure. Indeed, our journey is almost over, brothers and sisters, in the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 13, verse 11, and that knowing the time, that now it's high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. 
let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armour of light. Thank you.